Good morning, everyone, and, and happy Amazon Prime Day. I'm Jeanette Sadekhan, uh, Chair of NAPCO and Principal at Bloomberg Associates, also formerly Commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation. And before we begin, I want to remind everybody that closed captioning is available by clicking on the link at the bottom of the screen today. So today is a very postmodern day. There's the global online sale underway without any underlying holiday. It just sort of cuts straight to the chase of the shopping without the inconvenience of having to wait for an actual holiday. And while there will be many happy customers upstream, the further you go downstream, you see the serious and corrosive impacts of online shopping in real life. That post pandemic, city streets are increasingly unready for prime time. Online shopping, of course, was a lifeline for people to order supplies safely during the pandemic. And online sales grew by a colossal 44% in 2020. And it was driven by sales of toilet paper, kettlebells, stretch pants, and ring lights. And online receipts are now 21.3% of all retail sales. That's the largest one year increase in market share in history. These lockdown era experiences have reset consumer habits and increased the appetite for online shopping. But delivering on the success of this business model relies on a failing transportation model. Home delivery has turned city streets into pop-up parking lots, loading zones, and distribution hubs for America's commerce giants. And you see carriers sorting hundreds of packages on the sidewalks and streets here in New York and in other cities. An online order can arrive in multiple packages by the postal service, UPS, or private carriers who deliver almost anything large or small. A package of paper towels arrives in the morning, a box of cereal arrives around noon, and a small tube of bike chain oil is handed off in the afternoon. But each of these objects represents a truck or a vehicle trip. And while we love to see those delivery people pulling up with our must have items, we don't always appreciate the truck that brought them double and sometimes triple parks outside our buildings, blocking traffic, blocking bus lanes, blocking bike lanes. A report published last week by NACDO, Bloomberg Associates, and Pembina calls for urgent action by cities to ward off this delivery deadlock with global examples and strong new proposals. Everything from creating micro delivery hubs in neighborhoods to loading zones that are better managed through technology and pricing. From establishing citywide e-commerce charges to making better use of our vast network of underused inland waterways. These are logistical practices that industry and governments can adopt and adapt today. And many cities are seeing it uptake in the use of things like cargo e-bikes for delivery, picking up parcels and area micro hubs and consolidation centers in dense areas. Local transfer centers also make it possible to make the final leg of trips in a compact electric van instead of a truck, reducing both the physical and carbon footprint of trucks on streets. It's increasingly up to cities to take action and experiment. Santa Monica piloted the nation's first low emission delivery zone earlier this year, giving a priority to low emission vehicles. And curbside parking remains a vast untapped resource with decades old regulations that don't reflect our current uses today. And cities are often in the dark as to the size and the cost and the op operation of loading zones. Digital resources like the Shared Streets Curb LR project can create detailed maps of curbs, allowing cities to analyze, to manage price and allocate space depending on needs at a specific time of day, but much more work is needed on this. And if the past is any indication, we need to use all of these tools right now. Last year, sales on Amazon Prime Day totaled 10 
$1.4 billion. And some estimate that 2022 will be the first year to record a trillion dollars in online sales, which will of course be accompanied by an increase in dangerous traffic congestion, pollution, and pedestrian in injuries. The fact is the future of online shopping is downloading on our streets right now. And if cities don't start laying the groundwork for something better, we'll watch the truck traffic and impacts mount. And I wanna thank all of you for being here for this important discussion today. And I want to bring Mira Yoshi into this conversation. She's a powerful new voice on freight mobility. Mira is the former chair and chief negotiator of New York City taxis and limousines, which also includes Uber and Lyft and everything in between. She's the new deputy administrator for the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration and is pending confirmation as administrator of the 1200 person agency with offices in every state and the Virgin Islands. She's a good friend, a strong ally and leader and is responsible for keeping the nation's supply chain safe. And with 70% of freight in the United States delivered by truck, that's no small task. So it's my great pleasure to turn this over to Deputy Administrator Mira Yoshi to open this session. Mira? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeanette. Um, and some sobering numbers in that preamble. Um, I'm almost reluctant now to ever order anything again. But nonetheless, I will, like every other American, we'll go through peaks and valleys of, of ordering and not ordering, um, trying to find the right balance. But doorstep delivery, which was all the rage before COVID, certainly hit its boiling over point um, during COVID when people sheltered in home and in place and relied entirely on e-commerce. Um, so the strategies of how you get stuff where it needs to be without harming people that are doing that work, without harming the communities where that work is happening, um, and our fellow road users is the absolute fundamental balance that our country must achieve now. So I really want to thank NACTO um, for once again leading the charge on one of the most critical and human issues in today's transportation. Cities are amazing because of their people, diversity, and the spontaneity of street life and community that's created. And because we all need slash want stuff to survive and thrive, making sure how we get it and how that happens in a way that's supportive of urban vibrancy is vital to your members and to the caring transportation community at large. And it's really, really gratifying to be back in government and working for an administration that deeply understands this critical balance. As Jeanette mentioned, I'm head of the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. And it's a mouthful, and it's also a mode that not everyone is familiar with, but everyone's daily life is affected by. As Jeanette mentioned, 70% of freight movement in this country happens via a truck. That's 600,000 businesses of all shapes and sizes from those that haul cattle to Amazon that come to us for operating authority. It's over 3 million drivers and 5 million trucks that are covered by our safety regulations. And annually, these drivers and vehicles cover over 100 billion miles, moving over 4 billion tons of freight. And we can't do this safety work alone. We award over $300 million in grants to state partners to support state highway, truck, and bus safety enforcement. On June 8th, just a few weeks ago, the Biden-Harris administration announced the creation of a multi-department task force focused on solving supply chain disruptions. COVID revealed to all of us the vulnerabilities of America's supply chain. And the disruptions we're witnessing today at ports, in trucking, and within cities are actually symptoms of renewed life. The administration from day one has been hard at work and successful at reviving a dormant economy. But how this works over a year of being at home through pandemic life is not going to be a straight line. 
vaccine rollout and economic relief have us out interacting, buying, making, selling, and delivering goods and services with renewed vigor and putting pressure on our nations and our global supply chains. As part of USDOT and part of the task force, we're focused on both short-term and long-term solutions using all tools available to minimize the impact on workers, consumers, and businesses in order to bolster a strong economic recovery. The bird's eye view of freight movement and transportation is critical to addressing the on the ground challenges ranging from port operational limitations to truck driver capacity. And this work cannot be done without close partnership with transportation and supply chain stakeholders and convening think tanks like NACTO, whose longstanding ability to approach and change problems with excitement and vigor is always welcome and needed. So thank you. Thank you for the critical and timely release of Doorstop Delivery Era Report and for inviting me to participate in its unveiling. And I look forward to a much needed conversation on creative solutions to keep us all safe and to keep stuff moving. Thank you very much. Mira, thank you so much for that great assessment. And it's clear that every part of the supply chain brings its own challenges from the assembly line to the doorstep. And we're so happy to have you in place looking after our system in Washington, DC. And now I want to invite Carolyn Kim to introduce our all-star panel. Carolyn is the Ontario Regional Director of the Pembina Institute, one of the leading clean energy think tanks in North America who helped produce the report we're going to send to all of you following today's session, if you haven't seen it already. Carolyn, thanks so much for your great work. Let's get this panel started. Thanks very much, Janet, and to Mira for your introductory remarks um, and for hosting this very timely event. And to our audience listening today, thank you for joining us. I have the pleasure to moderate this uh, conversation today. I do wanna note that there is opportunity for you to ask questions to the panel. So at any time of the discussion, feel free to put your questions in the chat box and we'll be sure to uh, visit them at the end of the discussion. Now, Janet and Mira have both framed up the conversation, the challenge and the new realities, the disruptions that cities are facing quite well. Uh, they both talked about the solutions, the policy actions that's required to shift to lower modes, uh, to lower uh, impact and low carbon modes, taking trucks off the road and helping in general, the urban freight system become more efficient. And the good news is that there are many practical solutions that are being implemented today. And we're so thrilled and lucky to have some of the leader, uh, leaders that are, are really advancing the solutions across North America, in Europe, um, around the world today. We've been working, as Jeanette mentioned, with NACTO and Bloomberg Associates to highlight these opportunities. Um, and you know, this discussion is meant to dive right into the challenges that are undoubtedly will be uh, needing to be addressed. So with that, um, I'd like to invite the panelists to turn on your cameras and I'll introduce you one by one. First up, we have Francie Stephan, Chief Mobility Officer and Assistant De uh, Director of Transportation of the City of Santa Monica. She leads Santa Monica's transportation policy, street design, operations, and programs work. Welcome. Uh, up next, we have Nick Bowes, Chief Executive, Je Chief Executive for the Center for London, a think tank focused on developing solutions for London. He was most recently the mayoral Dis director of policy at the Greater London Authority. Gordon Bronson, head of urban innovation at Reef, is also joining us, a company that connects people to goods and services through neighborhood mobility and logistics hubs in Canada, US and Europe. And finally, we have Andeshe Ranjbari, manager of Urban Freight Lab at the University of Washington. She is a research scientist at the Supply Chain Transportation and Logistics Center at University of Washington and is the manager of the Urban Freight Lab. So 
first up, a question to all. Let's really paint the picture of the pressing challenges that cities are facing, including those in your own backyard um, that have faced over the past year or even before the pandemic when it comes to urban freight. Freight is not on everybody's radar. So whether it's a small or large city, uh, let's kind of communicate to the city planners listening in today across North America. Why is it important for us to address these solutions today? Francie, let's start with you. Great, um, happy to jump in. It, and I uh, wholeheartedly agree that one of the biggest challenges is the lack of it being on the radar. Uh, certainly in smaller cities, I mean, some larger cities have more robust legislative and policy arms that are constantly looking at new issues. When you deal with the thousands of small cities across the US, oftentimes they have the basic operational infrastructure and not the uh, real capacity or flex to be able to take on some of the issues of freight. And many of the electeds don't have it on their radar in terms of street use. They may have it in terms of business economics, local economic development, but not in terms of uh, street safety and some of the things that Jeanette mentioned. Um, so I think that is a key thing. Um, speaking for Santa Monica, our particular issue was about uh, emissions. Um, we're a city where sustainability has always been top of mind. And we've done a lot with our building stock, but uh, our moving infrastructure really was uh, becoming the biggest portion of our emissions. So we. Uh, remodeled everything and uh, found that emission uh, CO2, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector were 64% of our local emissions. And so it became a critical thing for, uh, for global climate change, but also just local health. Um, so th that was a major factor for us. And, and it really has helped get it more on the radar. And Ashay, how about you? What is your why as you work at the Urban Freight Lab? Yeah, I think uh, the opening remarks from Jeanette and Mira really um, painted the picture pretty well. E-commerce was already growing before the pandemic and uh, uh, the pandemic just amplified everything. Uh, I think the urban delivery is undergoing tremendous changes. So people are people are uh, needing their packages, not just the next day, by, but the next hour maybe. Uh, meal delivery is now a significant part of urban deliveries, and uh, we also see new vehicles on the streets. So deliveries are not anymore made just by vans and trucks. We see uh, passenger sized vehicles, we see uh, cargo bikes. And so cities need to be nimble and creative because we are seeing new demands and new challenges. And so we do need new solutions if we want to solve uh, these problems that we're facing. How about you, Nick? Hello, everybody. Greetings from London. Uh, I don't disagree with uh, much of what's been said already. Over here, we've had uh, all the same trends before the pandemic um, of increased amounts of online shopping and the deliveries that went with that and the threats that that posed to more traditional forms of retail. Historically, London has had a congestion charge since 2003, which was, as the name suggests, focused on trying to reduce congestion. Uh, more recently, we've had the ultra low emission zone. The focus of that was to incentivize people driving much cleaner vehicles. What we haven't had yet is anything that has tried to uh, manage the growth of freight on the streets and delivery. Vans. And I think that that is going to be the next challenge for the city because during the pandemic, uh, the number of uh, people having deliveries to their homes exploded. Um, and for many people, it was a lifeline uh, for people that didn't, because if in, in central London, inner London, less than half of households have a car. So being not allowed to leave your home as we weren't for many months. Uh, the supermarkets doing deliveries to home was really important and like many other people I got to know my many of my delivery drivers by their first name because they were coming to my house so much during lockdown uh, and people have got a taste for that now uh, and I don't think we're ever going to put the genie back in the bottle on that uh, but as traffic levels return to what they were before the pandemic and they were pretty bad uh, we will have all these added uh, delivery challenges uh, to deal with on, on the roads and how we manage our very limited 
road space. And at the moment, that there isn't a policy solution being proposed to that, but I think there will need to be some clever thinking very soon. Over to you, Gordon, if you uh, want to add in your perspective here. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And uh, thank you for, for having me today. And it's, it's great to be with all of you. Um, you know, so, so I think something that Jeanette said that, that stood out to me is, uh, you know, the, the idea of our sidewalks becoming, you know, littered with, with uh, trucks and, and, and distribution happening and people trying to sort packages and people trying to move. This is, you know, this phenomenon is happening in, in every major city. Um, and uh, one of the one of the photos that always pops up in, in some of our materials when we're talking about what Reef is and what we do is um, is a photo that our CEO snapped uh, in, in downtown New York, where you had a, a Pepsi truck and a Coke truck blocking an ambulance from being able to make it down one of the uh, one of the avenues. And, you know, each of the trucks were sort of parked halfway on, on the sidewalks and they took up the sort of the middle of the street together. And when you when you think about the impacts of that happening over and over again throughout a city, um, it's it's creating a lot of problems, a lot of challenges. Challenges. And so, you know, Reef's, Reef's take on this was, you know, being able to take uh, take parking lots and take parking structures and turn them into uh, delivery and distribution hubs. And that's what we've been that's what we've been working on, you know, diligently for the last couple of years. And it's been amazing to work with with partners like the Urban Urban Freight Lab and being able to work with with other partners all over all over North America to try and figure out solutions. Whether that's you know last mile last block solutions using things like e cargo bikes and scooters, or it's it's you know coming up with innovative ways to to get lockers closer to where people's homes are. Um, I think there's there's uh, you know, there's a there's a quiet revolution happening right now, and and what an amazing um, what an amazing day to be having this conversation right on right on the Prime Day, uh, you know, national holiday, everyone's everyone's favorite national holiday, um, and thinking about sort of what this what this next era is going to look like, and and you know, my belief is that it's going to come back to uh, creating you know more walkable, more pedestrian friendly, more bikeable cities, and and using new kinds of tools to encourage that kind of behavior. That's great. Lots of um, lots of things that uh, I'd love to get into later on. But first, I want to just touch on the public health imperative. And Nick, I want to uh, go to you to just um, so that you can unpack some of the the key messages, some of the grave concerns that have come up that really came to the forefront as you were implementing um, in your in your previous role and your and your current role. Uh, the the urban freight solutions in London. Yes, of course. So uh, the most recent uh, initiative, which predates the pandemic, is the ultra low emission zone. Uh, which, for those of you that uh, don't know much about that, it's a flat charge for the most polluting vehicles to drive into a geographical area, and it's done using uh, uh, automatic uh, vehicle recognition by number plates and cameras. So it's a flat binary charge. You cross a boundary, you're not compliant, you have to pay a charge or a fine. Um, and that was brought in 2019 in the, uh, the most central bits of the city. It's had some quite dramatic impacts on uh, air quality, very uh, welcome improvements. Problem before the ULAS came along uh, was that 10,000 people a year were dying prematurely in London because of poor air quality. And uh, the number of people suffering from asthma was increasing every year. Uh, many people were, were suffering from asthma only during adulthood, including the current mayor, actually. Uh, I think that's one of the things that kind of drove him to focus on this as an issue. Um, the, 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 and the ULES was not without controversy because there's obviously a very strong car lobby in London. So a lot of people were worried that they wouldn't be able to afford uh, purchasing a cleaner vehicle. But the focus was very much on trying to get the dirtiest vehicles off the road. It has had a dr rather dramatic effect. Uh, before the ULEF came in, less than two fifths of the vehicles were compliant. By the time it had come in, it was over 80% of the vehicles were compliant. The next stage is uh, to widen that zone in uh, the autumn of this year to an area that's uh, nearly 20 times as big as the original zone. So it'll be a cover almost. Uh, all of the central areas of the city, all the inner boroughs of the city, 3.8 million people, uh, and the aim is to replicate those air quality benefits. Um, of course, if the, if the vehicle is uh, compliant, um, uh, it doesn't have to pay any cost. 
So if you have a fleet of the cleanest uh, delivery lorries or vans, you don't have to pay a charge to drive in that zone. Uh, you're compliant. You're not you're not contributing to the worsening of the air quality. So there's a limit to what it does in terms of helping deal with the challenges of freight and congestion, but it has a, a remarkable benefit to air quality. And we sold this to Londoners in my previous job by really focusing on the health, public health benefits. We didn't talk about it as an environmental scheme. We didn't talk about it as a scheme to reduce congestion. We talked about what it would do for the public health of Londoners. And it resonated. Most re There was an election recently, which some of you probably saw for Ma the Mayor of London. The ULES was a divisive issue. Some candidates were saying that they would get rid of it. Some were saying that they would ex expand it. Uh, the current mayor was re-elected on the uh, promise that he would expand it. Uh, and the most recent poll said that 68% of Londoners supported that policy, um, which I think is uh, quite a dramatic endorsement for, for uh, that scheme. It's now been replicated in many towns and cities across Britain, um, but it, it, uh, it, uh, come the autumn, it's going to be, uh, have a very dramatic impact on, on London. Thanks so much for sharing that, Nick. I want to go to the other panelists to talk about some of the pilots and projects that they have been involved with. Um, and Gordon, I liked how you put it. It's the quiet revolution that's happening. So Francie, um, why don't you go uh, next um, and talk about the, the pilots, the projects that you are leading, um, which may serve as a best practice and a model to other cities. What is the most single most impactful in initiative and, and why? Yeah, so um, our current pilot is a partnership with the LA Clean Tech Incubator. So a sort of middle uh, mediator between the city and the private sector, similar to UW, uh, you know, many other organizations, there's one at University of Oregon and the Pembina probably as well. Um, and I bring that up because it's it's a really key part of the pilot that we're doing. Um, it has enabled the pilot to move quite quickly. And what it basically is, is uh, an exploration of, lot, of a lot of different possible ways that we could reduce local emissions that could, you know, we, we basically cast the net very wide to really learn, knowing that half of them, maybe more wouldn't work, but to sort of be open to the learning that came out of that. So we cast the net wide and said, you know, we're interested in uh, electric cargo bikes, we're interested in electric trucks, we're interested in curbside change. So there's a, there's a component where we're identifying priority curbside locations, we're putting up new signage, that's helping us learn about local legislation and enforcement rules. So really we sort of cast, the, we sort of cast it all out there and said, you know, we're a small city, we have the ability to be sort of fairly fast and nimble. So let's, you know, let's take advantage of that and see what we can learn. And some of the things, um, I will stop and say one thing, which is, uh, you know, to, to any small city, and because there are so many out there with so many different local characteristics, I think it's important to remember that the best pilot is the one that just can move forward in some way. And that teaches you something, right? It, it can be different in every single city. For us, we happen to have the benefit of a really robust bike infrastructure. So we really wanted to focus on that. Um, in other places, you might have a port or you might have a different type of relationship that, or a very active business improvement district, in which case that's your live wire. And that's where you can make some progress. So I think it's important to just sit down and, and certainly for the, the local government folks to think about, you know, what are our competitive advantages? And I guarantee you have some. It's just a matter of sort of sitting and reflecting on that and businesses and you know, Gordon may want to speak to this too, but like, and businesses will respond to that, right? They want to be in partnership with a city that understands what they have and can help leverage that towards some sort of innovation towards the future. Um, so for us, you know, I would say, you know, we are midstream. I will say um, one of the most impactful, um, maybe not even in the most positive way, but I think it's important to talk about is um, one of the things that our council added to the pilot um, and I mentioned our pilot has lots of different pieces to it, but one of the pieces our council added was a local remote controlled delivery robot. It's a sort of cooler with on wheels that's operated remotely by a human being. Um, and I bring it up because um, it's not, I don't think it's part of the, the report that you, that you all prepared, but I wanna just caution people that it actually has really, I think set us back to some degree 
because when you have the robots on the sidewalk, it's a very visceral response of your community members and it can activate negative reactions to something that is already having some trouble gaining traction in your local conversation. Um, and so you sort of gain all this headwind with them when you might actually be better off focusing on electrified trucks or some of the other components. Um, so I, sorry to bring up a negative part, but I would just say that like, it's important to think about both the sort of pros and cons um, and how people and the, the general public might respond to something that is very visceral, that's on the sidewalk with them, that they might've had an interaction with that they didn't enjoy um, and what that might do to either, uh, it might, might set you back in some ways. But my overall thought is just, you know, build on what built, you know, pilots should be built on what your competitive advantage is and, and run forward with it and just try things. Thanks, Francie. And I think, you know, it's really important to, to point out those challenges, um, some of the pinch points, the, the pressure points, so that we can uh, address them together. Uh, Gordon, let's go to you because I know you're working with a number of cities. Um, Francie talked about, you know, the opportunity to leverage what you've got and to make it attractive for businesses to, to help uh, be a part of the solution. So tell us more about uh, a pilot or a project that you're working with. City yeah, on. absolutely. And thank you for the opportunity. Um, you know, uh, Francie, uh, Francie brought up a lot of great points and, and Santa Monica is actually a city that we've been, we've been working with on a, on a number of initiatives and they've been, uh, the city of Santa Monica has been an amazing partner. Um, and, you know, so the whole of LA County is a really interesting, uh, really interesting place for us. Uh, I think, you know, what, what I've been seeing consistently, uh, you know, and I, I started my, I started my career in, in government. I worked in, I worked in the federal government. I've worked in, in, in city and state government as well. And what's been really interesting is to see as, as, folks enter government who are, you know, as, as sort of the, the generation is switching into into more sort of tech natives and people that have come up in, in you know, in government in the last like 10 or so years, um, there's this a, a new appetite, a new appreciation for embracing public private partnerships and, and working together collaboratively to try and, you know, make communities a, a better place. And at the end of the day, we can bring as a, you know, as a private sector uh, company, we can bring resources and speed and agility, um, you know, to, to conversations that can be very, very helpful in, in helping to develop, you know, smarter and, and, and safer and healthier communities. And so um, in, in most instances, I can say that our interactions with local governments have been, have been really fantastic and we've been able to work hand in hand to um, try and build build new solutions. You know, one example of this is is we actually just recently um, launched a, a first a first of its kind pilot in in Miami um, around our mobile operating units, and we were you know so we we operate. Um, all kinds of uses in in our parking lots and our parking locations, um, and and we had to create a new carve out in the in the regulatory code, basically in the law, to to be able to you know have our, our use cases be be regulated effectively, and um, you know spent several months working with the mayor, working with with the with the team there in the city, and and was able to build out something. And now we actually, it's funny that you brought up the the robots. We've had a great relationship with an amazing company called Cartkin um, that's been doing uh, uh, robot deliveries within a mile of our locations in in Miami. And and actually, I I, I totally believe that you've gotten you've gotten negative feedback, but but we've actually gotten mostly positive feedback and we've had people actually like taking photos and sending them into the city and be like, look at these, uh, they've actually used the word cute little robots uh, sort of rolling around the streets of, of Miami. Um, and, uh, and so it's been, it's been really interesting to sort of go through that iterative process. I think, you know, you've seen, uh, you've seen use cases in the last decade where where maybe uh, companies have have taken a more uh, sort of hard nosed approach and and entered cities with maybe a bit more bluster than than cooperation and you know it's it's proved challenging and I think our our take is always it's better to come with open hands and try to figure out how we can how we can build things together our our team is filled with a lot of folks that you know come out of varied backgrounds, but people that really do care about, you know, trying to, um, trying to build better cities. And so it's, it's fun to be, you know, whether we're on this side or that, or the, or the public side, um, working hand in hand to, to do that has been, has been great. Okay. Let's revisit, um, the conversation on technology, but be before we do, let's, um, hear from Anda Shea to hear the single most impactive, uh, impactful initiative on your end. Yeah, really, um, it was it was fascinating listening to Gordon and Francis remarks, and I will really very much echo what they said in terms of uh, the importance of those partnerships between public transportation agencies and private industry companies. Um, 
that's really the philosophy of the Urban Freight Lab at the University of Washington. And uh, I can give you several examples of the pilots that we ran in Seattle and nearby that things would fail or would not go as planned if it was not for the partnership, collaboration, and shared understanding between uh, these companies. We launched uh, a micro hub uh, several weeks ago in Seattle. It's called uh, Seattle's Neighborhood Delivery Hub with Reef and several other partners. And uh, there were there were some hiccups and some uh, some challenges that. Uh, really, City of Seattle helped us with acquiring a permit. Reef, uh, our um, uh, our um, uh, e-bike manufacturer company, other players, they all got together to solve these challenges. And uh, so, it's I cannot uh, emphasize how important it is to have all of the players at the table and have a shared understanding. And the other thing that Francie mentioned, and I would also like to highlight that is. We, we all have these solutions and they, they are, they are uh, working in the area that they are, but it's not necessarily a recipe for all of the cities and all of the neighborhoods. Each neighborhood, each community, they may have and challenges. Um, and uh, so, for example, here, uh, the, the pilot that we have in Seattle, we have a common carrier parcel locker uh, in the micro hub where uh, neighbors can uh, order packages online and pick up their packages in the locker. And uh, it's a mixed use area. So we have residents and we have uh, businesses. It may not be a solution somewhere else. We had, uh, for example, we had a locker in a residential building uh, where residents actually complained that they had to go down the elevator to the lobby to pick up their packages. So they wanted their packages to be ordered at their doorstep. Um, so things are very different, and um, we uh, at the one other thing that I would mention that is working uh, really great at the at the hub that we have in Seattle, we have one of Reef's uh, quote unquote ghost kitchens, where they provide uh, favorite foods from nearby restaurants. Uh, they provide uh, they provide options for meal delivery and pickups, and that has been uh, receiving a lot of interest from uh, from the neighbors. So. Uh, I would, if I want to uh, paint, I want to uh, pick one solution, I would probably go with micro hubs, as I mentioned, because they provide a suite of solutions which are not the same for all neighborhoods, but they are a way to adapt to, uh, to adapt logistics to neighborhoods, which uh, I think it's something that we should uh, pay attention to. And Andeshe, can you just maybe point to uh, the most surprising thing that you've learned in your parcel locker or micro hub pilot. Um, because as you say, and as we may know, parcel lockers is not a new concept and it, it can be a seemingly small but impactful way. So just curious if you can just point to uh, a surprising uh, learning that you, that you and your team yeah, I can uh, I can uh, come up with several surprising and interesting things. Well, uh, one thing we learned was that uh, parcel lockers, uh, if they are in a place in a neighborhood location, like a sidewalk or an open surface parking lot, they do need their own postal address. Otherwise, carriers are not able to deliver to them. So that was something that um, it was interesting to us. And we went through getting uh, the process of permits. Uh, we spent a lot of months uh, getting the permit and all of the logistics, but we did not know that if we don't have a postal address for that, carriers cannot deliver to the lockers. Um, the other thing was that uh, lockers, well, and it's an obvious thing that lockers need power and Wi-Fi, but uh, gaining power for lockers can actually be very challenging. Um, our team spent about five or six months going through several hurdles of getting a permit from the city, getting approvals from uh, many agencies involved to get a permit to place a locker in a sidewalk that would be accessible to um, all of the neighbors. And I remember how happy we were when we got that permit. But when we went to the site, we started uh, the process of installing the locker, we realized that we cannot get the power from the nearby building or the light posts uh, on the street. And um, so it was really a deal breaker and we had to go somewhere else to, to place the locker. Um, and another thing I would mention uh, to your point, yes, they are not a new solution. They have been around for a while, but um, 
they have become more appealing to carriers and residents because of, again, the increasing demand for urban deliveries. Carriers like it because it reduces the overall travel time uh, that, uh, that their vehicles and drivers have by reducing the time they spend parked at the curb. And residents like it because it provides a secure place for them to store their packages and pick them up later at their own convenience. Um, and uh, they don't need to worry about their packages being stolen. Thanks so much for that. I mean, who knew about the issue of power? So I guess we can't have a really long extension cord that uh, just, you know, people can plug into. Well, um, one thing that our uh, parcel uh, company told us was that they saw instances that people unplugged lockers to charge their cell phones. So just- okay. uh, <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's zoom out now. Uh, we had a sense of some of the neighborhood level solutions. Um, Nick, I wanna go to you and kind of talk about the city, a, a larger scale kind of solution. Going back to uh, your, your remarks on ultra low emission zone and Francie, I want you to weigh in here um, because I can't imagine the number of you know, stakeholders that need to be involved, the different stages of planning, the years of, of all the uh, effort. Um, what have you learned so far? Who needs to be involved? Nick, over to you to say a few words. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it was uh, the, the planning that went in over many years was absolutely enormous. Uh, uh, when I was in my previous role, it was, uh, it was like we were on a war footing for many months in advance of the introduction of ULES. Micromanaging all of the details uh, on a daily basis. We ran an enormous public information campaign using the television, uh, radio, newspapers to get across what the ULES was aiming to do. And as I mentioned earlier, we're always talking about it as a, pu a public health issue. Um, we mobilized the stakeholders, the environmental stakeholders, the public health stakeholders, um, I mean, it really did, over a period of time, transform the public narrative on air quality uh, to, the, to the extent that I think it's actually transformed the national narrative on air quality in the UK uh, after London took the lead on this. Um, the, the, uh, the alliance of civil society groups, charities, campaign groups was really, really vital because they just have much greater reach than public authorities and politicians do. Um, the similar, similar, we had to think very carefully through uh, how we supported the, those groups that were most vulnerable, those that perhaps couldn't afford to buy cleaner vehicles or were worried about being lumbered with a charge for driving into the zone. Um, the mayor did manage to scrape some money together to set up a scrappage fund to help charities that had minibuses and some older people uh, that had vehicles and small businesses that wouldn't be able to buy, afford to buy a new cleaner uh, vehicle. And uh, uh, we did this over well over a year's worth of planning in advance, uh, at the same time as having to avoid and negotiate our, our way around any potential legal challenges of which the threat was always very live, um, uh, all the way down to actually just thinking about when's the best day to actually launch this. Uh, and. Uh, the chosen date was during the school holidays when the traffic would be lighter, uh, which was wise, and it got off to it got off to a really really good start, uh, which was absolutely critical. The technology worked; it was much tested. Uh, I mean, it really was a monumental amount of time and effort we went in to make it a success. Uh, uh, but uh, the whole thing has now been repeated over again for a scheme that's going to be seventeen times bigger than the original one. How about you, Francie? You're kind of earlier in the stages of, of planning and implementation. So um, anything different from your perspective? Yeah, um, much, much, much earlier. I, what Lund is doing is amazing. Um, you can only dream of that. Uh, so for us, I think um, critical was the engagement with actual businesses. I mean, they know a lot about what's happening in the curb because they're there all the time. They also know what the needs are. We talk, we've talked mostly about business to consumer delivery, but actually one of the really interesting things we've seen succeed quickly is business to business. So we're working with a linen delivery service that has multiple customers in our emission zone. 
And they're one of the ones that are the most positive about the ability of you know, the, the dedicated curb space to make their operations more efficient and to help them do their business quickly and really helps motivate them to continue seeking low emission and no emission vehicles. Um, so I think that has been a really interesting learning. We didn't expect that. Uh, and and has been a, a key takeaway. So I think um, really working with the, the business community um, and folks that really, and whether it's a business improvement district or actual businesses has been, has been really key. Um, and the last pitch I'll make is just that um, one of the things that I think is really important is also to make sure we communicate why that, why a curbside change exists. Like if, if that's part of the work that someone is doing, we've maybe reallocated curb space we often as public agencies just assume that it's obvious why something is the way that it is. But I think um, with the taking just a short amount of time to create some information for the public about why something is innovative and new, what it's doing to the to, to Nick's point for public health, for their own well-being, um, I think is a really uh, is a is a key part of it. And I think um, just really helps us all build momentum towards innovative uh, delivery solutions. Great, thanks so much for that. Uh, questions are rolling in, and so I, I want to go straight to it. And um, I think, uh, Gordon, I'm going to direct this one to you. Uh, market and transport trends are quite fluid, and yet much of the city infrastructure is fixed and immovable. So what can cities do to adapt their streets, which weren't perhaps built for um, you know, some of the new emerging technologies, the perhaps alternative operational delivery systems. You talked a lot about uh, a walkable 15 minute city. So what's your perspective on this? I love this question. Uh, this is great. Um, you know, so I think that, so, so part of the way we look at this, right, is that at the end of the day, uh, the opportunity is is enormous to sort of rethink the way we look at, at urban infrastructure um and you know much in the way that like Jeanette did in New York where it was like hey we're gonna like create bike lanes we're gonna build bike infrastructure we're gonna, like we can do all of these things all of these things um you know that we've we've all these rules we've created for ourselves around the way that we sort of manage uh the operations of cities those were all created by by people and, and people can change those and 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 you know we can adapt and, and build things for the for the 21st century I think that um you know the the easy answer is like you know, come work with us. We'd love to we'd love to um, be a partner to every city and sort of figuring figuring these things out. Um, you know that's where we saw as a company like our founders saw this incredible opportunity, which was to which was to take spaces in cities. Um, you know as as ride sharing has increased and parking you know parking needs have decreased. There's an incredible opportunity to take these 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 parking spaces and turn them into turn them into 21st century infrastructure and so for us that's meant everything from you know mobility logistics hubs and last mile last block delivery to neighborhood kitchens um you know to doing things like urban farming um to even like exploring ways of of adding to the infrastructure for like 5g and 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 uh, and you know cloud computing and and rack space and that sort of thing and so i think that at, at the end of the day you know what i've seen is that Generally, private enterprise is going to move is going to move at a speed that's always going to be a step or two ahead of where of where regulation is comfortable. And so and so the work that we get to do in in concert with with city and state and federal governments is to think through what the future of the zoning and regulatory framework could look like. And so you know by investing in micro modular mobile zoning and making it more flexible. For for you know private enterprise to think about how to use some of these some of these spaces to build that kind of infrastructure, um, you know I think that there's there's you know extremes on both sides. There's super rigid zoning codes and there's cities that have basically no zoning codes. And and somewhere in the middle, there's an opportunity to build a, a new paradigm that focuses on 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 flexibility and and changing the needs or you know changing the zoning code to adapt to the needs of the neighborhood, the needs of the community, um, so that you know the way we look at it is is you know if right now there's a there's a serious need you know in in parts of a city to have lots of package delivery and lots of food delivery that's great five years from now eight years from now ten years from now that need could be completely different right and as we're getting as we're having conversations with companies that are you know doing all kinds of things around like drone delivery or you know companies like we just we just did a, a, a partnership with joby that's doing you know vertical takeoff and landing vehicles for, for passenger transportation in cities like these are really exciting innovations that seem like science fiction but like they're not that far away and i think they're going to become more normative you know much more quickly than people people might anticipate and so thinking about how we can how we can get ahead of those um and build spaces that are flexible and can be adapted to to 
support these new use cases, um, I think is the opportunity that we have in front of us right now. Anyone want to respond to that? Policymakers re responding to uh, and you know making sure that we modernize our municipal codes uh, to accommodate these new these new innovations. Uh, anyone want to add to to that perspective? I mean, I'll just piggyback and say I think we have to engage our enforcement staff in it. They're oftentimes one of the folks that are most uncomfortable with the changes, and so that's just a key con internal constituency that we could all do a better job of engaging. That's a that's an incredibly important and great call out. Yes. <laughs> I think our, our challenge in London is we've got a very complex uh, governance uh, model in the city. We've got a mayor uh, with very limited powers over only 3% of the road network. We've got 32 separate boroughs with all sorts of different political persuasions that look after the other 97% of the roads, neither of which have actually got very many powers. Um, but uh, that, uh, but there is a there is a groundswell. There is a desire to do more, and something at some point is going to have to give. We have this another kind of slightly unique uh, uh, historical thing that you would expect us to have in the UK, and that we have some very big old landowners um, in central London. Uh, for example, Regent Street, one of our prime re uh, shopping streets in the West End. Most of the land around there is owned by the Crown Estate, which is the Queen, basically. Uh, uh, and there, there, there were, I'm, I think I'm, I'm trying to remember my numbers, there were 27 separate refuse collection companies coming to take away the refuse from the shops on that street. Uh, but because there was a single landowner, the landowner could uh, streamline that down so that there was a big reduction in the number of uh, refuse collections and similarly they're working on uh, streamlining deliveries too using uh, uh, delivery hubs further out in the city so you can do some quite interesting things because of the kind of slightly quirky land ownership issues that we have in London due to sort of medieval things that happen in the city um, uh, but the governance I don't think is probably as good or as modern modernized as it should be for the challenges that we face. Great point there. Um, we have another question here from an audience and and Ashay, I'd like to point this one to you um, because your uh, freight lab does focus a lot on the last 50 feet um, and helping people to become a part of the solution. Um, from your perspective, do you see an opportunity to lever some of the empty re retail spaces that have perhaps come online, whether it's from the pandemic or you know, uh, for other reasons, to create a density of distribution hubs. You talked a lot about micro hubs being one of the most impactful ways. Um, is, is there a lot of opportunities for cities to maybe leverage those types of underutilized assets? Absolutely, yeah. So, um, I mean, underutilized uh, retail spaces, uh, parking spaces, as Gordon mentioned, uh, and Reef is doing that, and uh, uh, maybe some of the transit terminals. So any of the spaces that uh, we, we uh, that we see that they are underutilized and uh, well, of course, land use and zoning uh, permitting, and this is what needs to be worked with the cities. But uh, we can use those uh, those areas as uh, consolidation centers to, to increase delivery density. One simple option would be uh, to, uh, as we did in our uh, pilot in Seattle, to uh, put a parcel locker there, as I mentioned, because lockers, you mentioned about density and lockers really create delivery density because instead of a driver delivering door to door and floor to floor, they can deliver to one place. And if uh, we can, we can, we have the capacity and rules permitting, then we can have those micro hubs uh, as a, as a place for providing those uh, opportunities and really thinking about new ways that we can address uh, we can address these challenges. As I mentioned, we're not uh, anymore living in an era that all of the deliveries are being done from, uh, from fulfillment centers and with trucks and vans. We have uh, smaller distribution hubs and we have smaller vehicles uh, that are doing deliveries and we can engage the community to uh, to come up, to come and pick up their own packages to uh, to complete their own last mile. That's what we're hoping to do with the neighborhood parcel walkers, for example. So the short answer is yes, we can use those spaces 
Uh, we just need to engage the community, engage the city, and make sure that we're doing it in the right way and we're not neglecting other needs and uh, uh, preferences. Great. We have time for one more question and I want to make this a lightning round, so perhaps 20 seconds or less, and I want to focus on one challenge. One challenge that uh, you have faced in implementing these strategies. Um, one question that have, has popped up was how do you get buy-in? And so if someone wants to touch on, uh, on that, that would be great. Let's start with Nick, over to you. So, uh... Uh, be really clear about what your message is, why you're doing what you're doing. Build a really big alliance around that of political stakeholders, charities, campaign groups. Use the media and stick to that message and sell it to the people. Gordon, how about you? Yeah, uh, I, I agree with what Nick said, and I would, I would add um, invest in small business, invest in women and minority owned businesses, invest in disadvantaged communities and um, help, you know, lever use, use the platforms that you have to help grow those constituencies and those communities and, um, and you can do a lot. Go ahead, Francie. Um, I would say, you know, every every our city is suffering financially in some way, shape, or form, and this is a way to bring private sector partnerships to the table to do work more efficiently and to build local value in partnership with the private sector. So there's a really strong financial argument to do it. And the last word goes to you, Andeshay. I would say listen and uh, be open to uh, new technologies and new solutions. So uh, there's a lot of innovation going on in the, in the industry space. And uh, uh, really, if we, we, we don't need to stick to the old solutions, we, we need to open up and listen to new solutions. And I say listen, because most of the partnerships really come from a shared understanding between uh, public agencies and private industries, learning about each other's pain points and how they can work together. That's a really great way to end it. Uh, I want to thank you to our panelists for, for joining today and sharing your insights to you, our audience, for listening in to Mira and Jeanette and those from NACTO and Bloomberg Associates for convening this really timely conversation. Please visit NACTO.org or PEMBINA.org to get a copy of our report. And finally, this webinar has been recorded, so we will make sure that is available to all afterwards. So on behalf of uh, the team here, thank you so much for joining and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye now. Thank you for having us.